Hi, my name is Lendra Facchinetti and let's write some code together, shall we? What we have on the menu today is this. This background art, it's a piece of art. It's this background animation that I made for this new product I'm working on. It's called Course Lore. It's going to be a forum for students and it will be open source. And I think that this background and also the logo that you can see here and everywhere else in the app is the perfect representation of the idea behind a forum for students in particular. Because this animation is based on a mathematical thing that is called a Hilbert curve. And I modified the Hilbert curve in some ways to draw this and, and make it look nice and make it artistic. If you're interested in the mathematical part of it, there is a great YouTube video by Three, Bla Three Brown, One Blue. I think that's the name of the channel. There is also a video in the coding train in which he, the, the guy uh, in the coding train just uh, implemented the Hilbert curve. And what we are going to do in this video is take it to the next step and implement drawing the Hilbert curve or what they call a pseudo Hilbert curve. I will not talk about the mathematics. I will just talk about the, the, the graphics and how to make it look nice. And I will take it a step further because I will make it, uh, well, I will make it move and I will draw it in this other way that is kind of all over the place. And I think that this is nice and it represents the idea behind the forum because it is a line, it's a single line. It may not be clear from all the movement going on, but it's a single line. And it's as if you just put your pen on the paper and you move it around in a systematic way such that you are going to visit every point in the plane. So a Hilbert curve is something called, it's an example of something called a space feeling curve, which means that it will visit every point in the plane if you take this uh, far enough, which we are not doing here. Of course, you can see that it's not covering every point in the plane. Again, it's a piece of art based on the Hilbert curve. It's not a mathematical thing. I'm not even sure that this version would be uh, a space feeling curve. I, it, I may have broken that property along the way to make this look nice. And also another thing that is interesting about the way we are going to do this is that I am not going to use any libraries. I'm not going to use any uh, frameworks. I'm just going to use whatever the browse, the browser gives us. So we are going to work with the, the core technologies in the browser, which is nice. I mean, it's nice to do things this way. It's also nice to use tools like P5.js that and then used in the coding train video. That is also great. But I thought we'd, it would be nice to show that you don't need anything extra if you want to do this kind of drawing and animation. You can just work with the things that come with the browser. It's not that hard as we are about to see. So I'll keep this open. And I, remember, we are only going to do the background here, okay? I'm not going to redo these parts. Uh, with the text, though that part is kind of boring and that's why we are not covering it today. So let's uh, open here both uh, a tab with our code and our code here on the left. And as you can see, we are starting from scratch. I have nothing on the screen. So let's get started with an HTML template. So there is already a lot on the screen, but I'm just using this template that gives me the basics, um, like a title and I would call this uh, Hubert, because it's based on the Hubert curve. It's not really the Hubert curve, but it's based on it. And now, to draw things on the screen, there are two main ways to do it. First, there is Canvas, and second, SVGs. And Canvas are bitmaps, and that's what most libraries that draw, like P5.js uses Canvas by default. It is just a bitmap, a grid of bits, and you can say what, what each bit is going to be. So each pixel is going to be a different color and you can do that on the level of pixel by pixel or you can draw lines and, and so on and so forth. So that's one way of drawing with HTML and just the basic technologies that come with the browser. It's, used, it's to use a canvas. That's not what we're gonna do today because we are doing vector graphics. I mean, it's very clear that these guys are all lines on a plane, they are vectors. So 
but we are going to use instead is SVGs. And SVGs is an image format, but it's also something that the browser understands natively and you can embed SVGs in HTML. So that's what we're gonna do. We are just gonna start with SVG and we can draw, for instance, a line. So let's try to make a line appear on the page. I think that the way you draw a line, I'm not 100% sure, but I think that the way you draw a line is by saying what is the X and Y coordinates of the origin and then the X and Y coordinates of where you want the line to go to. And the coordinate plane in when thinking about SVGs, X and Y zero zero is on the upper left and then going to the right is positives and going down is positives in both the X and Y axis and negatives would be to the left and to the top. So if we do something like this, then maybe we will see something on the screen and we don't. Okay, so maybe that's because I am not saying what the color of the line should be. Maybe it's because I am not specifying the size of the canvas, maybe it's both, we'll see. So I think I need to say stroke color. No, not stroke color, I think it's just stroke. Yeah, there we go. So now we have something on the screen. And I didn't say what the dimensions of the canvas were. Well, it's not really a canvas, but you can imagine the drawing area of the SVG. And the SVG is vector graphics. I think I should, I should mention that. I think I have said that. Anyway, so the SVG has this 300 by 150 pixels dimension. I don't know where that comes from. I think it's the default in the browser, but I, I think I should specify the size explicitly. So I'm going to say that the width of the thing is going to be like the original, like the one I have on this page is going to be 600 by 600. So I specify the dimensions using this. And then when I refresh, now it is occupying 600 by 600, as you can see in the blue outline here. But I'm also going to play another trick, and that is to use a view box. So the width and height is how much space the SVG is going to take on the screen. So that, that's the 600 by 600 we just saw. But then there is this idea of the view box, and that you, you can pretend that 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 width and height that we are putting here, that is the dimension of the SVG on the screen. It's like the screen in which you would project a movie in a movie theater. And then the view box is how zoomed in that image will be. So you, you are taking the projector and you are uh, rotating the lens so that it is projecting more zoomed in and therefore cropped or more zoomed out. And you can see more in the same the same projector, the same screen, you will be able to see more or less. You will be zooming in and out. That's one way of thinking about the view box. And it is convenient for us to specify a view box that is the unit. And it's convenient for us because we can work with the dimensions that grow from 0, 0 to 600, 600. It would work, but it's less ergonomic to work with 0 to 600. It's more ergonomic to work with 0 to 1. So that's what we are going to do. We are going to see if this will work out. I think it will. So in the view box, we need to say the x and y coordinates of the origin of our view box, and then the x and y, co uh, y coordinates of the end of the view box. So now this coordinates of 100 don't make sense anymore. I should say just one because that will go from the upper left to the bottom right, I think. Okay, so that's something. It's way zoomed in, but it's like a line that is way zoomed in. So let's see if I can make that line um, thinner and, and make it more like a line. So the way I think I will do this is to specify a width for this stroke that is very small because the default width of the stroke, so there is this property called stroke width, and I think the default is one. Yeah, that doesn't change anything, but I can make it smaller, and I think that will have an effect. Okay, so it's smaller now. It's looking more like a line. Let's go further. In fact, I think I know the, ex the exact value I want this to be. 
I want it to be 1 over 600 because I want it to look like if it was a, a one pixel, but it's not. It's going to be uh, zoomed in, so I want it to be 1 600th of a pixel, so it's 0 0.001, which is about what we have here. So this is about a pixel width. So there you go. Now we know how to draw one line. Let's draw several lines now. And I'm going to go to the Wikipedia article folder for the Hilbert curve, because in the Wikipedia article, there is this image showing you how to construct the Hilbert curve. And again, I will not go into the mathematics, but what I want to do is to draw first this first order curve and then take it to the next levels, to next orders. So let's start with the first order. So what we are going to do is just draw several lines, four of them, and they're going to be this, or actually three of them, because it's going to be these three lines over here. So let's do that, three lines, and the, the stroke width will be this small number for every one of them, and the stroke will be black for all of them. What we want is just to change these numbers. So for this one, I want it to start, so one way to think about this is that this is dividing the plane in one, two, three, four sections, one, two, three, four sections, and one, two, three, four. So that's one way to think about it. So this would be coordinate zero, zero, this would be 0 0.25, 0 0.25. So that's where we start this first line. So we will go to 0 0.25. Then this one will be at 0 0.25 on the x axis and 0 0.75. So we will go there, 0 0.25, and 0 0.75. And for now, I am going to comment out all the other ones and see if we have a line here. Yes, that is good. So for the second one, I want it to go from where the previous one ended. So from this position. And I want it to be the Y position. I want to stay the same because I uh, the Y coordinate, I want to be uh, the same. I don't want to move up or down and I want it to come over here. So X is going to be 0 0.75 and Y is going to be 0 0.75 as well. And then for the last one, we are going to start from 0 0.75, 0 0.75 and we will go to uh, the X stays the same. We're not moving left or right. So it stays at 0 0.75. And Y will go to up here, which is 0 0.25. Remember, we are just dividing this plane in four. So this is 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75. Now let's refresh this and we have that shape. Excellent. Now to move this to the next step, what we are going to do is just take this shape and we are going to pretend that this, it's, this is a stamp and we are going to stamp it over here on the upper left corner, but we are going to rotate it. So we are going to rotate it 90 degrees. Uh, so I guess we're rotating it, not, not exactly 90 degrees, because this, is, this has a notion of order. It starts here and goes in this direction. And this one, I want to start here and go in this direction. So that's stamp number one. Stamp number two is it starts here, and does this. So it's exactly the same as the first order one, but it's over here on the lower left. The third stamp is similar to the second one, but it's over here. And then the fourth one is flipped all over because it starts here and goes this way. And then after I have this stamp, this stamp, this one, and this one, what I do is just connect all of them. And this way I get this shape, which is the second order Hilbert curve. So that's what we're gonna do. Before we go there, I think I need to establish some infrastructure here that helps me to go over um, this idea of dots on the plane and then connecting them 
so that I can connect the stamps more easily. So we're going to change the way we are drawing this. Currently, the way we are drawing this is with a bunch, with a bunch of lines. But in fact, SVG gives us a way to draw something called a polyline. And this is as if you put your pen on the paper and you move it around. So now I'll say what the stroke and stroke width are just once because I will get rid of all of these lines and I'm going to pass a bunch of coordinates. These coordinates will be given in a property called points. So I'll comment out all of these for now and I'll just copy over the coordinates. This will take a while, so hang in there. Okay, so I finished copying everything over and first let's see if that works. Well, it doesn't, it looks like this. Maybe what I need to do is just tell it to not feel anything. Okay, so because this is a polyline, it will try to feel that shape with uh, some color, but I don't want it to feel with anything. So if I, if I say feel none, then it d just draws the contours. And it's worth mentioning that in SVG, when you have to pass a bunch of coordinates, which is the case, for instance, here and here as well, the separators can be commas, so you are fine doing this. The separators can be spaces, so you are fine doing that. And in most cases, I think what you will see is things like this. I find this annoying to read because you don't know where which one starts and ends, where each one of the points starts and ends. So what I do by convention is I put a comma right after one of the coordinates. So this is x, y, comma, x and y and comma. So just a convention for reading. It doesn't really make any difference in the drawing. Okay, so why did I do this? Why did I convert from a bunch of lines into a polyline? Well, it's because now we can just generate this string. Effectively, it's a string with the coordinates for all the points, and it's going to draw that shape for us. And what we're going to do next is to write some JavaScript that generates this string for us. So the SVG portion is pretty much over at this point. What we're going to do now is write some JavaScript to generate these points for us. First of all, I need to be able to execute some JavaScript. And as far as I can tell, the SVG specification allows you to have script tags in the SVG itself. I have not been lucky using that. So what I do instead is put my script tag right after the SVG, and I can then refer to the SVG by saying what is the tag that occurred right before myself, and myself being here, the script tag. So let's see how this works. In the script, I can refer to the document, that's something that comes with the browser, and then in the document I can say current script, which gets me, you guessed it, this tag. So let's see how this works by saying console log of that, and come here to the browser and actually open the console, and we see that it's the script tag. So now I can say, what is the previous element sibling that is the tag that occurred right before the current script tag? So that will be the SVG. And there it is. So now we have a reference to the SVG. And I'll keep this reference over here. In the SVG, I can query selector for my poly line. And here it is. So now I have a reference to the polyline. I will call this polyline. And I have access to the attribute points. So I can say something like polyline get attribute of points. And here are the points. So now I have a reference to the points that I can see, but more importantly, I have a reference to the points that I can write to. So for instance, I can say polyline set attribute of points to be the one we had before that draws just one line across the screen. So now I can change the points using JavaScript, and this is key to what we are going to do, because we don't want to 
write all the points for all the coordinates. What we want to do is to just write some code that will generate the coordinates for us. So let's see if we can recreate this using JavaScript and then I can get rid of this line. So we'll have a notion of points here that is, the, we don't want to look at the points that are here. We want to calculate these points, right? So what I'm going to do is change this so that it's going to be an array and when I say set attributes, it's going to be an array of coordinates. So it will be something like this. I will hard code this for now. So it will be something like this. Okay, I did the magic of editing to get us here. So the points are going to be something like this. I copied them from over here. Oh, and I just noticed something. I uh, Before, when I had the lines, I copied the X and Y for each coordinate from the lines into the polyline, which means that now I have duplicate coordinates. This 0, uh, 25, 0, 75 happens twice. The 0, 75, 0, 75 happens twice. So effectively, we only need these four coordinates. We have some redundancy here and there. So now we have just the coordinates we actually need. But now I can say, okay, we have the points. So what I can do here is just say, take the points and this is a list containing the coordinates and I will flatten this list so it's no longer an array of arrays but it's just one long array so you can pretend that the flat is going to do this to our array and then I can leave it like that actually I think because if I have let's check this well I don't need to, to instantiate node here I can just do this in the browser so if I have something that looks like this Oh, okay, so points is already defined. So I'll say just points. Points is this, and if I say points flat, then I get just the numbers. But then when I say to string, which internally set attribute will do that for me, then I get a string that is separated with commas, which is valid SVG as far as we are concerned. So this is enough. We can just flatten the points. In fact, what would happen if we didn't even flatten the points? Would that work? Oh, look at that, that works. So we don't even need to flatten, we can just say points. That is super convenient. And now we can just refresh and it's still drawing the same thing, but it's drawing using this set attribute, which means that we can say that and look at that. Oh, and I'm still console logging the, do the points, but that's no longer necessary. So now look at that. We are generating the points to draw using JavaScript. And with this infrastructure in place, we can compute using JavaScript the points for the second order Hilbert curve. That's what we are going to do next. So I'm going to say that there is a constant here. The constant is the order that we want to go to. And if we say just order one, then this algorithm is already correct. According to the Wikipedia, that's the shape of the first order Hilbert curve. That's the shape of the first order Hilbert curve. Excellent. Now let's go to order two. Order two has this shape, so we need to stamp the points in the particular places. Let's start with this one, because this one is easy. So that's what I'm going to start with. Um, so the points um, are over here. I want to stamp them over here on the lower left. So I'm going to say that there are some new points and the new points are just a list that starts empty. And then for X and Y off points, I am going to push into the new points a new coordinate that is going to be. So the X here is take whatever the x was here and I will make it smaller, right? Because imagine this x is 0 0.25 and now I want it to be, well, lower than that. I don't know how much lower, but it will be lower than that. It will be smaller. It will be to the left. And this one is 0 0.75 and it will be to the left as well. So what we're doing here is just pushing everything to the left. How much? Well, let's think about this. We want to fit in this image, one, two, three, and then there is four, there is this 
two areas here that if you add up, they will make up uh, another one of these, uh, these spaces. So I guess what we want to do is divide by four. And I would do the symmetric thing for X and Y. And then I expect this to be on the upper left because I'm making the values for Y smaller so they will go up here. So then after having done that, I can say that maybe I don't need to say point, const points, but let points because then I can say points equal new points like that. Could I have just changed the points in place? Yes, but if I did that, then we would lose reference to the points when doing the rest of all the, the other four, uh, all the other three, we need to do the lower, the upper left, upper right, and lower right. So yeah, there you go. This is smaller and on the upper left. Now, all we need to do is just, just push it down. Oh, and you know what I just realized? We already have that space here on the left and on the right. So you can think of like, think about this part here in at the bottom. What we're doing is taking this whole image, not just this part, but this whole image and shrinking it and putting it here. So we don't have four of them, we have two of them. We have one over here on the left and one over here on the right. So instead of dividing by four, I think what I need to do is divide by two. That will make it slightly bigger. Okay, but it's still on the upper left and that's not what I want. I want it to be on the lower left. So I will keep the X as it is because it is correct, it's on the left, but the Y, it's on the, uh, it's on the top, it should be on the bottom, so I can just add half. And now you can see how convenient it is that I'm working with numbers between zero and one. So now it's on the lower right, uh, lower left. Now I will do the same for the lower right. And at this point, I think I need to convert this into uh, uh, brackets, I need to do that. And I need to have more of these auxiliary arrays, arrays. Currently, I only have one set of new points. But I think I need to have um, lower left is a set of new points. Lower right is another set of new points. And then I can say lower left is this. Lower right, we'll get to that. And then I can say new points are equal to, or actually at this point I can just say points, right? Points. After having done all of them, actually, so after this loop is over, I can just say points is not this array of new points. I don't need that auxiliary array anymore, but I can say something like lower left dot 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 and lower right, and dot, dot, dot. So if you're not familiar with this syntax, it's slightly newer syntax in JavaScript. What I'm, just do, I'm, what I'm doing here is just taking this array, which will have a bunch of points, and I'm splicing it in place. I am just breaking it apart and putting all the elements, all the points in the array into these points. So I refresh and nothing changed because I just moved variables around, right? But now let's do the lower right because currently it's empty. Now let's put some points there. We still want to shrink the thing in place. So if we just do this, then we have one right here. So it starts over here because we put the lower left here first. So it starts over here, does this, and then it goes there to the top left because we have that over here. So it goes to the top left and then it draws the, uh, the the shape again. Now it is in the right place. No, it's not right in the right place in the X and uh, the Y coordinate it's either. It should be here on the bottom. So plus a half and here on the X, I'll say plus a half as well. So now it is in place and this looks like the bottom half of the, the picture. Now we need to do the lower the upper left and the upper right. So to do the upper left, we'll start with an empty array. We'll go to, by the end, we want to have an upper left happening before the lower left. So remember, it goes from here to here and then here and finally there. So I'll put everything in place. So Upper left is first, lower left is second, lower right is third, and upper right 
is the last one over here. And I will do a bunch of renamings here. And I will also need the upper right over here. And I will comment all these two and just check that I still have the same shape. Okay, so I renamed everything correctly. So the infrastructure here is in place. We just need to compute the coordinates. What we are doing here is we want to start from here. So this point will become this point. And this point will map to this one. And this point will map to this one. And this one will map to this one. So one thing I notice here is that the X and Y are swapped because this is on the bottom left. So the Y coordinate is big, but the X one is not. And this one, is exactly the opposite. The x y uh, the x coordinate is big, but the y coordinate is not. It stays the same. So I think what I need to do is just swap the x with the y, and I want this to be on the upper left, so I'll not add halves to anything. So let's see how that goes. Okay, so that is the shape. So that is swapping x and y and doing this. And then it goes to this one. So these two dots are connected now because of the whole polyline poly line that we are using. So these two dots are connected and then it goes over here and then it goes over there. And then finally, we need this fourth one. So for the fourth one, I know that I want to add half to the X coordinate because I want it to appear over here, but I don't want to add half to the Y coordinate. And Let's see what this looks like. Okay, so this is almost almost right. Now I want to flip this so that this point is over here. Look at that. This one is here. This one is there. And this one is over here. So this one is a small x and a small y. It becomes a big x and a big y to get there. So I think what I need to do is just take the the opposites. So uh, we are working on a plane that is 0, 0, 2, 1, 1. So I can say 1 minus and I'm swapping. So everything that was small now is big. I'm, I'm like reflecting it on the mirror. So let's see what that looks like. Oh, it goes way to the end of the screen. So let's see what's happening here. Oh, I think I know what the problem is and it's kind of funny. What we are doing here is taking this to move it around to the right. That's correct. But what we want is not to, and, and this part, I should say, this part that is dividing by two is shrinking it because the initial first order Hilbert curve is big and I want it to be smaller. So I want it to be smaller, but I want only the, the resulting coordinate to be smaller. So I'm always dividing x by 2 and y by 2. And now that I'm flipping, I only want to do this, this shrinking after I do the flipping. So I need to do this. So now it's going to flip first and then shrink and then move it around. And it's going to uh, flip or mirror first and then shrink it and I don't need to move it around in this case. Okay, so it's still not right, but it, but it's getting there, I think. Because if you think about it, this is taking that Hilbert curve first order that was like this, and it's flipping it on its head. So I guess the only thing that I need to do is mirror it the same way that I mirrored this one. Let's see if that works. Okay, I'm not 100% sure that I understand everything that's going on here. And that's usually how these this things go. I have an intuition. Oh, I think I need to flip it in this way. And then I write the code and sometimes I get it right. Sometimes I get it wrong. Sometimes I get the parentheses wrong. And that's always fun. So now we have a second order Hilbert curve. This is now accurate. This is a second order Hilbert curve. Now, how do I get to the, first, to the third ordered Hilbert curve? like this one. Well, that's the fun part because of all this infrastructure we put in place from the polyline to the way we are building the points this way. 
actually all we need to do is iterate because this figure is recursive it is a fractal if you will so now we can say something like order starts with order two and then order is uh, less than or equal to the order that I want to reach and order plus plus and then I do all of these in a loop and then it completely breaks oh yeah of course I want to change this variable so I should say lat instead of const okay so this is something that looks like a third order Hewitt curve let's see them side by side because the figure is kind of complicated so it goes like this and that one goes like that yeah yep yeah. it looks correct so this is a third order Hubert curve let's go to a fourth order Hubert curve and you can see it getting more and more complicated as it goes but it's still just one line and it's filling this space so let's make it bigger bigger still and if we take this number and we crank it up eventually it will fill in the plane with all the space filled in yeah it's almost filling all the space as you can see can zoom in and see kind of probably rounding error from floating point arithmetic at this point super interesting stuff and if you just crank it to infinity how do you say infinity in javascript infinity is this a constant or do you have to say math infinity oh i think it's infinity with a capital i infinity oh and when i bring the developer tools it almost fails to do that so when i say infinity here now this is going to calculate the actual hilbert curve well, of course it won't. I don't have an infinite machine with infinite memory and infinite time. So we do not, we'll it will not calculate the actual Hilbert curve. I'll stop at, at, let's say, four. Yeah, so maybe maybe a little bit bigger. That may be too much. That sounds about okay. We'll see. Maybe order five. Okay, so this is the actual Hilbert curve. Now let's take this to the next step to draw the, the artful, the, the squiggly things. Not moving, not yet, but it will be squiggling. So the way I did this is, well, uh, first of all, I kind of, I, I am annoyed by these values. So what I'm going to do is just take all the 0.25s. And they should be not 0.25s, they should be one uh, quarter. And the 0.75s should be three quarters. Yeah, same deal, but now I think it represents better the idea of what this is. So these are the original Hilbert points. I'm going to keep them around as a comment. But the first thing I did to swap the, the to, to make uh, well, the, th the thing I did is to swap the, the coordinates and that will have an effect of drawing lines that look like this and then like that and then you can start to see the thing taking shape and what I did is exactly this to, to make that artful piece what I did is I went over some of these options and I said, hmm, this looks nice hmm, that one looks better, okay so eventually some of them looks like squares some of them looks like yeah, complete nonsense like that. And by doing this, this is the part where it may break. I'm not sure that this will, remains a space filling curve. It definitely is no longer a Hilbert curve. So let's say that this is now a Leandro curve. These are all examples of Leandro curves. And I'll find one that looks like this. Yeah, so this one looks like the one that I started with for the animation. So the next step is to do the animation. Let's do that. And I think that in the original piece I had order equals six. Yeah, so it looks more, even more uh, full of stuff happening. So I have a setting that I like. All I want to do is just animate these points. And the way I'm going to do this is, well, first of all, the, the first attempt of doing this was to just move them randomly. 
So let's, let's start with that. Let's start by moving them randomly, just because I want to show you how to do animations. So we know how to change the points in the polyline. What we do is we do this bit, right? So we have the polyline over here and we do this bit and we are animating the points. Now what I want to do is just call this in a loop and change the points ever so slightly between iterations of this loop. So how do I do this loop? Well, here is a first idea I could, and I want to do this forever. While I have the page open, I want to do this. So I could say something like this, or I could try. This will not work, it will blow up. When I refresh the page, you can see right beside my face that it is not loading. And that's because JavaScript is trying to run this to completion before it shows anything and it doesn't complete, it keeps running. So that will not fly. Here's a second attempt. Instead of saying while true, you could just say that this is going to be a function uh, animate Hubert or animate. I would just call this animate. And then you can call this on a window set interval of let's say 100 milliseconds. It will call the animate function. Like so. So I guess I need to close this browser tab and open a new one. So now this is completing and it's drawing to the screen. And it's drawing um, every 100 milliseconds. Now I need the notion of something that changes in uh, changes in time so that I can animate. So I'll create here a notion of time and a notion of time that starts with zero and on every frame of the iteration, I'll say that time changes one forward. That still doesn't change anything, but now I can use this when drawing the points. So I could do this before, but you remember that every time I go through the loop when I'm calculating the higher orders, it depends on the previous iteration. So anytime I'm, I'm going through this loop, I am changing the notion of points over here. So if I change the coordinates over here, they're going to influence the next ones. And that could be too much because then it becomes too chaotic. So what I'll do instead is over here, I will have the points, the, the actual points. You know what? I, you know what? I'm going to try. I'm going to try. Uh, let's see. What happens if I just add a random value, a small random value to the coordinates as I go over here? And I think it will be too chaotic. But let's see. So I can say math random that gives me a number between 0 and 1. So again, super convenient for working with uh, these coordinates because we are working on a plane of 0 to 1. And if I just do this, then it becomes too chaotic. Yeah, that becomes just all over the place. But I can scale the randomness so that it's not too drastic. So I can say divided by something. So now it will not go all over the place, but you can see that it's moving ever so slightly, right? And I can change this value and it will make the thing move more. So now it will move more. That works but it looks afraid. <laughs> so when I did this, I thought, well, this works, but it looks afraid. That's not the intent. I don't want this to be, uh, I don't want course lore to come out as uh, frightened. <laughs> so I did not go with that. Randomness was not the, the answer here. And also this set interval is not the answer here. It is kind of working. There is a limit to how much you can call set interval. And if you want things to be smooth, then you want to this number to be smaller, right? Now this is smoother, because, but because it is random, it is not jumping around, but it looks even more frightened. Yeah, that's not good. And there is a limit to how much you can call a function on set interval. But luckily, the browser gives us a facility for doing exactly this, animations. And this was something that I didn't know about before I tried to do this animation. So there is this thing called window request animation frame. And then you don't give it a timeout. You just give it the function that you want to call. And what this is going to do is 
on the next animation frame, it's going to call your function. So you don't need to pass a timeout because it will do it as soon as it's ready to draw the next frame. And this is respecting the resources more. Now this is moving all over the place and it's chaotic, but uh, it is using all the resources from this set interval. And that's bad because if your animation is taking more time to render, then ideally you would just lose some frames and that would be fine. But if you're doing this on a set interval, then the next time you're trying to animate starts to run as well and then you run into conflict so the idea of using a set interval to do this kind of animation is bad it's better to respect the resources that the browser gives you so if you have a lot of tabs open or if your computer is doing other tasks then you can lose some frames and that's fine and in general you just don't want to call the function on a fixed interval you want that to be dependent on the frame rate of the browser itself so there is a lot of a lot going on here. So instead of trying to come up with the ideal set interval, instead we just use this request animation frame. And the other cool thing about this is that when it calls your function, it calls that with the time, which we have not used yet, but we will as soon as we get rid of all this randomness. So now we don't need to keep track of time ourselves. The request animation frame will do that for us. But here we just defined the function. So we need to kick it off by calling it a first time. So what I just did is I put the whole definition of animate in parentheses. So now it is a definition of a function that I immediately call to set off the process. And then it's called first with a time of zero. And then the request animation frame will call animate again, recursively again and again and again. And it will give us the time. The time, I think, is in seconds or milliseconds, I don't remember, but it's the time since this page has loaded. So it's fair to start this with a zero and then increment it like that. So with request animation frame, you can see that it's even faster. It's moving even faster than the 10 milliseconds we had for the set interval. It's even smoother, but it's still freak out. Oh, you can see that when I scroll, it changes the frequency of the animation because scrolling in Visual Studio Code requests resources from my machine and then the, the, the browser doesn't have that much time to run my animation so it drops a few frames. Isn't that interesting? It's respecting the, the resources I have on my, my, on my machine better. Okay, so this is the setup I need to animate but I don't want to have randomness like that so I'll just get rid of all this math random plus I'll get rid of all of them and I will do something here to the points okay so I refresh the page we are no longer moving all over so now I have a bunch of points each one of the points is an array with two coordinates x and y well actually the thing I'm going to do is just to move the points around a little bit so I guess I can flat before I move the points around. So now I have just a point. This is just a coordinate. And what I want to do with the coordinate, well, let's first start with coordinate plus math random divided by 100. Okay, we got back to where we were before. I'm changing the coordinates as they come. So I'm taking all the points that I defined using this part. I am flattening, so now it's no longer a list of lists, it is effectively, like I said before, something more like this. And I am adding a math random of 100, but that's not what I want. I don't want the thing to look freaked out. Instead, what I want to do is just calculate something based on my current time. So here's an idea. What if I just take the time, and this is just an idea I just had. So what if I take the time and divide it by 10 and look at the reminder and then divide by 100. Yeah, so this is moving based on the time. You can see that it's still freaky, but now it is based on the time first and it is kind of repeating itself, but it's more controlled. Okay, so that's something. What if instead, instead of using math random or just this freaky function based on the time, 
I use something else that also cycles because the fun thing about using the time is that it increases always. It's always going up. In fact, let me show you. Console log of time. Let's open the console. Now my machine, let's see if my machine can handle this. Uh, open the console, refresh, and you can see the time ever increasing. So that's what the uh, that's what the time does. Okay, I'll stop this. That's what the time does. And then dividing by 10 guarantees that I'm always within a small number. Because if I don't do this, then it just flies away. <sighs> Goes away, never comes back. But if I divide by 10 and look at the reminder, then it is bounded. And that's why it's going up and down, up and down, because it goes down and comes back up. And the divide by 100 is just because I didn't want the number to be too big, because this way it's going to go off the screen and then come back, off the screen and then come back, right? And, and you can barely see it. It flashed twice, but then it was off the screen, because this value was too big, because I'm dividing by a 10. So what I want to do instead is just something like this. But... What if I used another function that is also going to cycle around and it's not as freaky as this one? Well, we have a function like that. It's the sign function. And I don't need to take divide by 10 here, I don't think. Okay, so this is, it's still flickering, <laughs> but in a more controlled manner. Let's divide by 100 and see what that's look, that looks like. Okay, it's, it's still moving too fast. Well, if it's moving too fast, the thing I can do is just divide the time. By dividing the time, I'll make it move slower, more slowly, right? Because I'm taking the time, I'm saying, okay, if one second has passed, pretend that one hundredth of a second has passed, or one thousandth of a second has passed, and now it's very slow, because I'm dividing the time. And this math sin is going to give me a number between 0 and 1. Actually, no. It's going to give me a number between minus 1 and 1. That's what the sine function gives me. A number between minus 1 and 1. Oh, this web page is using significant energy. I find that when you introduce math sine of big numbers, it does that. We can try to figure this out. Anyway, so... And I don't know if it's because big, I'm... I'm talking about big numbers here or just because this uh, the sine function is slow. But anyway, I always see this when I'm working with this. And I can even sometimes see that when I'm on the course lore page. I'll try to figure this out. Anyway, so the sine function is moving around from minus 1 to 1. So it's moving to the upper left. You can see that there is even some clipping happening here on the right and on the left. So it's giving me a number between uh, 0 and 1. And if I divide by 600 because of our magic number over here, then I know that it's going to move one pixel to the left when it's minus one, when math sine is minus one, it moves one pixel to the left or one pixel to the right. It's, I can barely see that. I don't think I can even see that at all. But now I can do this and it will move two pixels to the left, two pixels to the right. So I guess I'll do divided by 100 and multiplied by like say the number three. Now it's going to move three pixels to the left and three pixels to the right. And you can see this moving just a little bit. Okay, but all the points are moving together, right? They're all moving together here. And that's not what I want. I want that chaotic thing to be happening. I want that, that whole movement to be happening. So one thing I can do is depend on the index of this coordinate. So I think that when JavaScript calls you, the uh, JavaScript calls the map function, it calls, come on, give me help for the map function, please. Okay, so it calls me with a value and then the index. So I can use the index over here as well. So not only based on the time, but based on the index. I'm adding the index, I could be multiplying it. I just want it to be in there in the sign function so that it is different for every pixel. And there you have it. That is pretty much how I created that animation on the index page. There is still one part left, that is the gradient. And the gradient is up here on, it's easy to define, up here on the SVG, 
you have a session a section for definitions and you can define a linear gradient i can never remember this one so i always go to mdn svg gradient and pick some example up so linear gradient and i'll start with this one let's see what this does so the way you use a gradient in SVG is you give it an ID. So this will be my gradient. I'll call this maybe just gradient. And then in the stroke, instead of saying black, you say that element. So let's see what that is. Okay, it is a gradient. And then you can say where the stops are for this gradient. Oh, there is this gradient transform that I don't need. So now it's going from left to right. I would like it to go from top left to bottom right. And I think that there is a way for me to define coordinates of the starting point and ending point of this gradient. So I can say x1 equals 0 and y1 equals 0. So pretty much the same thing we did here for the view box. And x2, I think it if I need to define that in percentage. So that's what I'm going to do. And that's different from just the view box because the gradient applies to anything. It is so the same gradient in the depths section can be applied to multiple elements in the body of the SVG. So that's why I have to talk about percentages here. And then there are the stops. The stops are where in this line, effectively, you are drawing a line from 0, 0 to 100, 100. And just for completeness, I'll say 100%, uh, 0 0% here as well. So there is this effectively a line between 0, 0 and 100, 100. Where in this line is your stop? Where do you want to reach that certain color? I want that to be from the beginning to the end. So now that it's a gradient growing from left, top left to bottom right, as you can see. And now I just have to change the colors to the colors that I used in my project. And for that, I am I, I want to nerd out about this. So I used the colors from Pico 8, this fantasy console. They have a palette somewhere, colors. Yeah, it's somewhere in here. So yeah, I, I think I got this one for the upper left and this one for the lower right. And I have never programmed for Pico 8, but I think that would be super fun. So there you go. Now we did it. Uh, we did something different here. So this is this is slightly thicker, I think. So the polyline here could be slightly thicker, maybe 0 0.005. That was too much. And that sounds about right. Yeah, so that sounds about right. That's more or less how we did this background. More or less, but not exactly. I mean, there are some things I did different. But I guess the most important one is, suppose that you don't even run JavaScript in the browser, then you are not going to run this code and you won't even see the points. You, it's not that you won't see the animation, you won't even see the starting position of the animation. And that's pretty bad. So what I did in the actual version is I used Node.js to pre-compute these points. So the first iteration, so the first time I go around in this uh, this loop of points, I compute that using Node.js and I put that statically. So it's like a static website generator. I just put this, those numbers there. And then, oh yeah, I guess that's something that I can change, right? Because the points here remain the same and I'm calculating them every time I go through the loop. So every time I go to animate, I calculate the points. I don't need to do that. The points remain the same. After I have computed everything once, the points remain the same. And then I do the animation using this part. So I guess I can do it like that. And that will maybe make things better in terms of performance because I'm not computing the whole Hilbert curve again and again for every frame. The Hilbert curve stays the same. This, the order is the same. And then you can play around with this. What happens if you put seven over here? Funky. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, the thing I did is just I played around with these numbers and I asked my wife, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And then eventually we reached this, these numbers that we kind of like. I think this looks awesome. And yeah, there you go. A thread 
And if you, it, it's the perfect analogy for a forum, right? I guess I, I didn't explain that in the beginning. Yeah, it's the perfect analogy for a forum because a forum is, remember, course law is going to be a student forum. So a forum is made of threads and there is this one thread that if you push it hard enough, it will cover the whole plane, the whole field of knowledge. <laughs> Isn't that something? All right, okay, so that's all I have for you today. Thanks for watching this. I hope you had fun uh, with some cool mathematics, some art, drawing SVGs in the browser and doing everything with our bare hands, no frameworks, no libraries, though frameworks and libraries are awesome. It's also great to understand how everything works without having to use them. And drawing with SVG is super powerful, but at the same time, kind of easy if you want to do this kind of generative art thing. We also learned how to animate things in the browser with request animation frame, how to control SVG using JavaScript. It was a whole lot of fun. Anyway, I think this is it for now. I hope you like this. Make sure to subscribe to this channel because I always have more fun things coming up related to programming, related to audio effects and editing videos in Reaper and all of those sorts of fun stuff. I see you on the next one. Thanks for watching. Bye.